it's a pleasure to have you on. Nice uh, to see you with the early birds. Um, it's it's great to have such a specific event dedicated to robotics. Obviously, I don't know if uh, Mark has uh, filled you in. We, we've run a great number of these events that are very general, very wide with corporate security uh, series. Uh, but this is the first time we are uh, you know, embarking on this. And of course, Steve Reinhardt's CEO, Robotic Assistant Devices. It's a pleasure to have you uh, on board for this. Um, what do you think we can hope to achieve today? I think that spreading the word of how technology is truly being integrated into guarding and process is really the, the message that I carry to most every forum that I uh, present at. Okay, and, and, and why do you think that perhaps robotics is ready for this audience now? Because a lot of people will be thinking, oh yeah, absolutely, in the future this will happen, but, but why now? Well, now, because we have the solutions now, uh, the, the products and the systems are out there now. So uh, we, like you said a, a second ago, you know, we know all the stuff is coming, uh, but there's a point when it arrives and we're at that very beginning point of arrival. Okay. And, and, and for those people in the audience, could you paint a picture of what we're actually talking about. Are we talking about the Terminator? Are we talking about uh, spiders from Minority Report? <laughs> what, what, what are we actually talking about? You know, there's no question that at some point the sophistication of these robotics devices are going to improve as they'll improve across other elements of our life, you know, for home robots and just a variety of different types of robots. Right now, you know, we use the word robotics um, in kind of its truest form, which is using some type of automation in order to streamline a process without human use, right? That's pretty much the definition that I use. So because of that, we have, uh, particularly at our company, but other companies as well, there's purpose-built devices to perform certain processes. And I'll share with you how that relates to security. The current security world right now, if you're a practitioner, if you're on this call and you know you may be nodding your head saying, if I'm a practitioner and you want to apply security to your enterprise, you can choose from two different buckets of solutions. The first is man guarding. You know, you call up your favorite guarding company. Hey, listen, I need a couple guys or girls or people. I need them to patrol this parking lot, stand in this lobby, check out these doors, right? Whatever the, whatever the post orders may be. Or you find uh, electronic security devices, cameras and access control from a systems integrator. So those are the two buckets that we uh, can draw from right now. Or that's, those are the two traditional buckets. What we're saying with robotics is that there's a third bucket that's being created. And whereas the first bucket is high on service and interaction, and then the second bucket is high on forensics after the fact and basic control. The third bucket, using robotics and using AI, brings both of those elements together because we perform services, we perform control functions and forensic functions, and we add the ability to do advanced process management throughout the, throughout the uh, solution as well. So specifically what that means in simplest terms is we want to simulate the best of what security officers do, and we want to do that using advanced technology. We want to do that in order to have a set of robotic solutions that allow enterprise organizations advanced security solutions at a fraction of the cost of what they might otherwise be done. And that's really what a paradigm changing solution has to do. It has to come in over the top with greater functionality and significantly lower cost. And that's the point uh, uh, where we're at right now. I see, yeah, because a lot of people are thinking maybe, oh no, it's gonna replace me. But this over the top and you know, augmenting process, I think is really, is really, really key. Um, now I know you'll, you'll get into this in, in your presentation, of course, but, but why should physical security specialists all the way from you know, maybe a large multinational all the way through to maybe executive protection. Um, wh wh why should the whole spectrum stand up and take note of this? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good question because they deal with it every day because the industry asks us every day. 
And the reason why they ask us is that our industry, our security industry, both man guarding and integrator security, is um, incredibly risk averse, resistant to change, set in their ways. It is not a tech forward uh, type of industry. And there's good reasons for that. Uh, the number one reason is, is that it's not its job. Its job is to, you know, provide tried and true solutions to problems, right? It's not a risk-taking industry. It's a risk-averse industry by, by its very definition. And that's fine. But the reality of this is, is that there are companies out there right now saving millions of dollars that are going straight onto their bottom line while providing better security and less risk to their clients. So if you're a security practitioner, it's going to come for you if you don't get ahead of it, if you don't start getting engaged, if you don't realize that your job isn't going away, but it's changing, right? So those folks who understand that and who jump into it and start testing it and start getting ahead of it, those people will have a competitive advantage in their career and they'll be doing their fullest duty to the organizations that employ them. I love it. Well, let, let, let's get into it then. Um, you know, that's that's a lovely scene setter. You know, it, it, pe people will have started their day thinking, I, 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 I'm not necessarily thinking of robotics. So that's that's helped hone them in, uh, focused in. And, you know, John in the audience, definitely a dynamic shift in thought process. I like it. Um, so, Steve, uh, you have the floor. You're, you're welcome to share your screen and, and everything you like. And I'll be here in the background. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. It's it's nice to be here. I hope this isn't the uh, the last time that we get to that we get to chat. I love the work that you're doing. Uh, the questions that you gave me up front are fantastic, and together, uh, you know, let's let's work to change this industry because someone's going to do it. So it might as well be us, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll 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 be here for you know questions and everything, and I'll I'll be here at the end of of course as well. So, um, you you have the floor, and uh, yeah, very much looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. So I don't have any uh, slides or visuals uh, for uh, for the presentation here this morning uh, or this afternoon, depending on where you're at. But really, what we're going to talk about is the transformation that is going to, or rather, that has started in both man guarding and in integration. Now, when I say transformation, really what that means is that a portion of those two industries is going to change, is going to transform. We certainly don't um, expect, you know, we're, we're, we're not in the business of replacing, you know, a 400 camera project at a manufacturing facility. Uh, we're not going to eliminate, you know, 20 security officers running around the campus. What we're going to do is we're going to integrate advanced solutions that are easy to use in order to perform better and save money. And in the process, what we're going to do is uplift the existing or the remaining humans that are gonna stay in those roles. So like I said a moment ago, we're not um, eliminating jobs, but we're changing jobs. And this happens across every industry that faces any type of technology influx. Uh, you know, we could go back in time uh, you know, as far as when, you know, first real technology came about with the wheel. Um, I like using uh, analogies of the conversion to autos from horse and carriage. And I like using analogies of, uh, you know, the microprocessor in telecommunications. There was a time when we had buildings around the world filled with switchboard operators. And all they did was, you know, take the plug out here and put it in over there. And of course, that was replaced. Now, those operators, they had to change their jobs. Um, and they became, you know, either a different type of telephone operator or they serviced a different part of the network um, in, in that industry. And that's what I'm saying is going to happen here. And that's why whenever I'm speaking with anybody in our industry, particularly practitioners, um, I, su I, I suggest that you start thinking about how your job is going to change and how this is an opportunity for advancement, for doing a better job, for carving out a, a legacy for yourselves, because this is one of those moments in times when you can actually do that, change, change is opportunity. Now, what we want to do from a practitioner standpoint is we really want to deliver the best service to our enterprise organizations. 
And that means the best systems, the best staff, um, you know, the most thought out processes. And there's only so much that we can do when we draw solutions from the first two buckets. In man guarding, we have a series of challenges uh, related to number one, the biggest challenge is finding qualified, interested team members who are willing to work for the relatively low wages that the companies generally set as their pay rates. Um, and of course, it doesn't take a rocket science or anybody in the industry for more than an hour to figure out that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. So what if there was some transformative technology that allowed you to reduce your reliance on man guarding, thereby freeing up labor dollars, which could then be used to actually create better careers for your security officers, because as you package a revised HPW with your electronic security, with your robotic security, at the end of the day, the numbers always prove out that you save money. So the concept here is that you, 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 you create a new security program, integrating robotic technology, and you reduce your man guarding, and you go back to you know, the sea level, and you say, hey guys, listen, we're gonna get better security using these types of devices, and we're gonna decrease our reliance on man guarding. And that's gonna solve a bunch of problems from staffing, risk, confrontation, those types of issues. And since we're saving a bunch of money, what I'd like to do is I'd like to add, you know, 50% to our pay rate to our officers. And I want to get career security officers instead of, you know, I, transient isn't the right word, but, you know, the, the temporary security officers that are often uh, the best security officers, you know, the university students or whatever, right? Those folks that are just really engaging and just need a job for a few years before they go on to something next. But what if these became real careers? Wouldn't the organization benefit? And wouldn't the organization benefit if there was security technology being introduced that then uplifted the skills of the security officers that remained? What if the technology was simple, it was in the palm of their hand, and it gave them true force multiplication in a decentralized format? so that they could start saying, hey, you know what? I use computers at work. I use AI technology to supplement my job. That's gonna provide another point of engagement, another attractive item to attract, retain, and grow the team, which of course is one of the greatest challenges facing the industry right now. Uh, okay, so what does this really mean? What are the functions that we're doing? Um, in my background, I think I have this, uh, you know, rad like my way uh, kind of backdrop. This is an innovative solution that we just uh, uh, won a significant innovation award from CBRE, which is the world's largest facility management company. And of course, they, they're not just the largest, but they're three times larger than their nearest competitor. And for those unfamiliar with them, what they'll do is they'll do facility management for the Fortune 500 uh, and everything below. So let's say you're Amazon or something, you, you'll say, hey, listen, I need 15 facilities and then CBRE will go and they'll find the facilities and they'll staff them and they'll manage them and they'll take care of them. And Amazon can concentrate on what Amazon does best. That's what, that's what CBRE does, a large part of what they do. Now, we have these large facilities and you know, CBRE gave us this award because we solved a significant problem. And the problem is this, uh, I'll give you the scenario, the problem scenario that, that led us to create the solution. I was walking a, um, a medical clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, I'm walking with the head nurse and uh, and she's, you know, we're just talking through problems and it's a bad part of town, a really, really bad part of town. And she says to me, she says, Steve, she says, listen, you know, again, our biggest problem is uh, retention of nursing staff. 
And I was like, well, tell me more. Like, why why do nursing staff leave? I mean, you guys pay top dollar. Like, literally in Ohio, they're paying absolutely fantastic wages. And she says, the problem is this. The problem is, is that when they finish their shift, they got to walk to their car. And I was like, okay, so what? You know, they walk to their car. Car's over there, building's over there. It's a big deal. It's a couple hundred yards or whatever. She says, the problem is this. After 12-hour shift, it's two in the morning, and these folks have to walk through this parking lot. Now, the problem with the parking lot is that there is a perception of insecurity in the parking lot because at some point in the past, a car was broken into, or perhaps there was an assault, or the car being broken into perhaps wasn't even at that parking lot, or the assault wasn't even at that parking lot. It was down the street or 10 years ago or whatever, but we all know perception becomes reality. So, you know, the rumor, you know, goes from this staff member to this staff member, and all of a sudden, regardless of whether or not the problem is real or the probability of a problem is high, you have this perception problem. Now, she said, the, the, the facility management, you know, and the property ownership, because they don't see any real problem, because this is a perception problem, they don't want to do anything about it. And the only solution that they really have on hand is putting man guarding in that parking lot. So they don't want to put man guarding in that parking lot to do uh, guard escorts because they don't see that there's a problem. Nonetheless, there is a problem for the head nurse. She can't retain staff after six or 12 months. They don't want to walk the lot anymore. So what we came up with is we came up with this idea of what if there was a more cost-effective and integrated way that that staff member, as they walk to their car, could put security in their own hands. And we came up with this idea that we ended up calling Rad Light My Way. So now when the staffer finishes their shift, uh, you know, as they're walking out to their car, they're walking out the door, they open up this application, they push one button called Rad Light My Way, and the devices in the lot will all activate. And the idea behind this is, is that we need to create a deterrence, right? You know, we create layers of security, insecurity, and one of the layers is, um, uh, is deterrence, right? It's probably our most powerful tool in security is appearing that we're difficult to penetrate, we're difficult to assault, you've got a high chance of being caught. There's going to be consequences, right? Like this is really what we want. We want to deter events. Um, so, you know, the devices that are in the lot will activate. The, the, the SOC, the Security Operations Center, will be alerted. Two-way audio will happen between the devices. The person in the palm of their hand will actually get live images of what's happening in the parking lot around their car. Now, it sounds super simple, it is, which makes it a fantastic solution, but think about being that staffer and think about having walking, having had to walk this parking lot over and over and over again with anxiety and in some cases, real fear. And then you say, hey, listen, I'm gonna, you're gonna be, you're gonna be escorted virtually, but not just that, it's not just reliance on a third party, but you're going to see for yourself what's happening in that parking lot before you get into that parking lot. That's the type of solution, the type of new solution that excites us, that improves security, that improves the, um, the facility itself, the company itself. Those are the types of solutions that you can do with AI um, enabled uh, technology because of, uh, because of how it works. Hey, Steve, so um, I, yeah, I, I just saw we, we, we had a few questions already. Um, okay, shall, great. I love shall, it. Shall, shall I save them up or shall I do them now? You know what? I, I really got the bulk of what I wanted to, to, to say out. So if we've got questions, then I'm, I much prefer having an interactive conversation. So thank you. I like it. Okay. Well, f thanks very much. Um, uh, Patrick uh, says, good point, Steve, and a route to invest in improving man guarding standard and capabilities. Uh, Asman says, very well put. Um, Kelly, uh, who's actually up uh, on the panel next, um, says, can you please give examples of robotic security tools other than security robots? 
Yeah, sure. Well, you know, the bulk of the tools that we have actually are not what you would consider security robots, right? Because people say security robots, you know, it's either our giant mobile security robot, which does a lot of interaction, but actually a lot of our security robots are fairly simple. Um, and what we're doing is we're using visual analytics to create an intelligent response. So for example, on its most basic sense is, hey, you know, I've got a warehouse, I have a restricted uh, area, a restricted parking lot, either inside or outside, and I simply use human detection, you know, AI-driven human detection, AI-driven vehicle detection, uh, in order to determine if somebody's in this area, and if so, I perform an automated response, an autonomous response from the device without human interaction. And that response uh, is getting smarter and smarter. So for example, when we started, we simply had, you know, a response panel that would do, you know, human detection and autonomous response. Hey, you shouldn't be here, please leave. Authorities have been con contacted. Re regardless of whether or not they've been contacted, some customers would say that. And it worked. It was amazing. It worked. It works. It's fantastic. Then a customer came to us and said, listen, we've got loitering problems. So it's not that people can't be in this area. It's that they can't be in here for very long. We don't want people smoking at the side of this building. We don't want people propping open uh, 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 exit ways so they could go and urinate in the, uh, you know, in the, in the stairwells. We don't want people sleeping in the stairwells, da, 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 da. but they can pass through. So we took the analytics and we built them into what we call loitering response. So now customers have ability to choose loitering response and count the number of people and one person's okay and two people are okay, but three people aren't and so on and so forth. So really, um, and this is the path that we're on, is taking that human decision-making of what a human officer would do in a situation and putting that into the machine so that we can continue to improve how the machines can simulate the actions we want humans to perform. I like it. And that, and that, and that, and that would, you know, free people up because I'm sure an EP agent, um, you know, for an event uh, looking after a celebrity doesn't want to be stopping loitering uh, going on. They, they probably don't want to do that. And uh, John, uh, actually, nice to see you, John. Uh, John asks, does robotics provide lower liability costs for insurance purposes versus a staff position? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So a few different elements on that. Oftentimes, insurance premiums are a function of the amount of labor expenditure on a particular project. So because of that, the lower uh, labor, the lower humans, obviously, the lower your insurance premium is gonna be. So that's a, a yes on number one. On number two, we've seen in the States, um, uh, construction insurance policies being reduced because of RAD solutions, because of these types of interactive solutions. So the answer is, is uh, yes and yes, uh, definitely involve your risk and insurance teams in these decisions because if you push the insurance companies, I have seen them take account and lower premiums for these types of solutions. I like that. Much as an advanced driving course might uh, might lower your premium uh, for your for you know for your car. Um, and so and so by extension, one thing that I'm sort of curious about, and I think a lot of people would be, imagine you look at the day rate of an EP professional that goes to a hot zone. Well, that's very high and it's very specialized. Um, but quite often you, you, you'll be hiring some people on a day rate for something not so exciting as a hot zone, maybe something to do with a mall, something to do with an event. Um, how, and, and, and of course this, this, this differs from state to state and wildly, and it's, it's almost an unfair question, but how does the day rate of a manned guard compare to renting out a rad yeah in general you're exponentially lower so for example let's say let's say you have a, a u.s average officer bill rate not pay rate but bill rate of 25 dollars an hour you can generally get a solution uh, between one dollar and five dollars an hour now the benefit of these types of solutions is that uh, in general at least ours, and, and I don't mean this to be an advertisement for us, but just you know, I think that we're kind of leading the industry is that we're cellular optimized. 
which means that, you know, and I didn't even really tackle some of the problems of the security in, uh, integration industry. You're running cables, you're doing networking work, you got switches and VPNs and, you know, you're on your customer's network, which is a real problem. Not with us. With us, you plug it in and off you go. You have full security in a box through cellular. Now, you talk about events, and this is where uh, the use of EP, uh, intelligent EP, allow you to cover those loitering areas, to cover those trespass areas without having to staff up because you're basically taking an EP agent, you're giving them, you know, 10 additional stations and those stations only buzz when they are interacting with a potential uh, suspect or violator. So that's, that's what we're doing. So now all of a sudden that one EP who's running around doing this and that, he knows everything that's going on, but it's not just that he knows what's going on, which is a traditional function, those robotic agents are working on his behalf, doing some of the job at those locations. And that's, that's, that's the promise of, of robotics. I like it. And, and, and just as an aside, did I hear a robot in, in your background? Or, or I know that... you heard my garage door. <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, it, 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 would have, it would have been too good, too good. It would have been, um, yeah. You'll either hear a garage door or a, or a, a, a flesh and blood canine uh, running around the background here. So... So that's interesting because I, I, I had a conversation about this uh, yesterday as it happened with uh, Mark and I sort of surmised uh, that if you did have a canine on your team, an actual dog, and you use that dog for a purpose, that's not going to be replacing you, it's augmenting you, right? So why do people suddenly think that to have a robotic canine or a robotic entity in another shape why do they think it's going to replace instead of augment them? Well, first of all, I want to take a, a less diplomatic and more antagonistic position on this. And Mark is my counterpoint. You know, he's my, you know, we complement each other really well because I'll play one side of the spectrum and he'll play the other. And I play a more antagonistic role um, here because I want to challenge our industry partners. I want to challenge the listeners, uh, the practitioners, everybody here. I want to kind of give them a bit of a shake and say, wake up. Okay. We, we, it's not in our duty to protect jobs. That's not, that's not like, you know, there's no job description that you've ever had from an employer that says you must always maintain X amount of employees or you must roll your employee. That doesn't exist. Right. But it, it's just become this political softball of jobs, 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 jobs. But regardless of what's happening in that type of, 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 you know, those forums where that's discussed, the reality is, is we're employed for commercial purposes to maximize profits for the investors. That's what our job is. We're all a part of that machine. And in order to do that, every executive everywhere is constantly thinking about how to reduce their labor, right? These are just the realities of it. So that's why I'm, I want to challenge people. Don't be concerned about job elimination. Okay. Number one, you can't be concerned about it because jobs come and go and that's, that's how life is. Okay. But focus on transforming yourself, transforming your own job, transforming your own career, being a part of this new emerging intelligence security industry. Um, and don't be, you know, and if you're doing that, if you're staying ahead, if you're embracing change, if you're adopting change, then you've got nothing to worry about. In fact, you just have things to be excited about. I get that. And, 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 and it's really, really important that, that we look at, you know, your job is security. It's not job creation. And, and if it was job creation, like maybe uh, some former Soviet bloc countries, then you'd have a job for the person at the beginning of the hall, a job at the end, a job in the middle. Yeah, we're not there, obviously. But in order to sell it internally, if one was to sell the augmentation story versus replacement, how would you do it? So, you know, augmentation is vital. And the reason why I say this, and, you know, for the benefit of your listeners is why I'm taking this provocative action and I'm encouraging transformation, right? So I, I, I want to state that out, you know, um, but I've never met a security practitioner who has said to me, you know what, Steve, I've got 800 cameras and 35 guards right now. And next year, I'm going to go down to 600 cameras and 25 guards. 
Those words have never been said. Okay, every security practitioner that I've ever met says, you know, I've got 850 cameras and 35 guards, and you know what? I'm so worried, it's killing me. I need 50 officers and 1,600 cameras, right? I need more. We're never given enough on security. We're the first to get cut when times go bad, okay? And when times are good, maybe we can squeak out some more dollars for some more initiatives, but it's never enough. It's the nature of the business. So with augmenting, with solutions that cost a fraction of what they might cost through traditional sources, either man guarding or the security integrators, security practitioners can go back to the C-suite and they can say, hey, listen, you know, for the last year, two years, three years, five years, I've asked for this, this, and this. And you've said no, because you didn't see the value on it. But now I'm saying, hey, I can produce that same value that I'm saying as your security practitioner, we need that'll close risk loopholes that we have in our system. But instead of asking for you know X amount of money, I'm asking for Z amount of money. And that's, that's where the augmentation with robotics is so strong. And that's where we can really improve the security stances of our facilities with, with minimal extra money. I like it. And uh, we've got, we got another question from Kelly. Um, uh, can, uh, and, and, and actually then John as well. Kelly says, can RAD work with camera systems or what would the cyber risks be? Yeah, so, you know, our, our system obviously has cameras in it. We're in a closed uh, network. We're in, you know, a very highly secure closed network. Um, we're just finishing up our SOC 2 Type 1 certification, starting our SOC 2 Type 2. I guess we started that on Monday. So cyber is very important. And because of that, we're creating a, um, I'm calling it a DMZ, where we can make our video cameras available to, you know, traditional legacy VMS systems for kind of full incorporation into those systems. Now, um, I still view that personally as traditional application and not overly interesting to me, but industry is calling for it, so we're going to do it. And the reason is, is that I want to get away from those SOCs, which I've built dozens of in my prior career. You got 4,000 cameras, two attendants watching. I mean, come on. I mean, we all know not effective. There's, there's, there's very, very rare when somebody sees something and, you know, provides a proactive action. It's always like, Hey, I get a phone call or an alarm buzzer. And then I bring up the camera and take a look. Why can't we be smarter about that? But no, certainly we'll make our cameras available sometime in this next calendar year. Yeah. I like that. And, and the, the SOS, SOPs, um, got a bit dusty and then COVID hit. And then it was like, where's the SOP part for, uh, for for pandemic, um, did, did we write one? Um, anyway, um, John uh, says augmenting and integration as part component of the security system. So security system as a whole. So everyone's part of the uh, part of the system. Um, I guess a lot of people want to get excited about where robotics can go, and they want. I mean, maybe they don't want it, but maybe they have visions of the Terminator. Maybe they have visions of your canine buddy that you put in the boot of the car and you whip out when you when you need it. Is 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 that is that plausible or, or or where's the more realistic vision of where this could all go? Yeah. So you know, I live in a, a weird futuristic world, right? Where I just try to think of where we're going to be, and then you know, with a great team led by Mark, we get to try to build it, right? Or we build towards it. So I, I will share with you, and again, um, not trying to be overly provocative, but just trying to be realistic and trying to move everybody a little bit towards acceptance. Yes, these things will happen and they are coming. There's no question about it. Let's use military as an example, right? Like a lot of times military technology is the, is the precursor to commercialization of such technology. And you know, you, you see it coming from different countries, but um, you know, you see the militarization of the robotic dogs, you see the militarization of like, it really started with autonomous targeting with drones, you know, that we've been using for 20 years already, or that Western countries have been using for 20 years. So, you know, I think, I believe, and I, I think this is pretty much accepted that, you know, a lot of future conflicts will be largely mechanized, uh, and autonomous. 
And it's scary. I'm the first to say it's scary. It's frightening. It's difficult for me to get my head around. And I understand that people reject it because they don't want to accept it because it is scary and it's new. And as humans, we're not practiced to accept change. And, you know, I understand that. Um, at the same time, I feel that if I have a voice that's ever listened to, I want to encourage people to open your minds and just accept it. Yes. Yes, it is coming. Yes, it's going to be weird. And because of that, it's an opportunity to get ahead of it. But it's definitely coming. Okay, fantastic. Well, or maybe not fantastic. I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. I don't know either. Um, um, I don't know either. But, but I really think that the way that our laws are structured, I think that it's going to be a good thing. I, I see a world of, of more connectivity and of um, better security um, and, you know, hopefully the, the, the ideal world that I see us building towards can become a reality. Of course, it, it's a complex, complex issue with a lot of social issues uh, revolving around it. But we certainly can do it if, if we collectively have the will. OK, fantastic. Well, then what's next for you? You know, what what are you working on at the moment? Um, what, what would you like people to, to, to take a look at if they if, if, they, if they were going to look at uh, RAD? I would love people to start to follow us you know um follow me on twitter subscribe to the website for updates follow our progress i think it's an easy way to start to transform yourself to accepting change and seeing how things are going and i would suggest that as everybody's uh, everybody's first step it's a very exciting time right now very exciting time great well I like this because this sets the scene from the, the doer, the doer who is actually doing uh, doing it. We got a nice comment from Stephen, who's actually up on the panel. Uh, it says, uh, currently security guard companies in the US are facing huge manpower shortage, struggling to retain and hire qualified guards. This tech provides another great option. Security budgets are usually the first to be cut until there is an incident, um, which, I, which I think captures a lot of what you Oh, oh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. It's exactly, <laughs> we're speaking the same language. Thank you. Um, and Robert says, this is a great topic and we are looking forward to next gen robotics uh, to augment our guard force. Um, fantastic, Robert. Fantastic. Well, um, could you put your uh, handles, uh, you know, for social media in, in, in the chat and then, and then and that, that'll, that'll make following you a bit, a bit easier as well. I absolutely will. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you for letting me share. Um, I, I promise everybody I'm, I'm a nice guy, not looking to take people's jobs. I just want to encourage you to, to be aware and adopt change. I love it. Well, please give uh, Steve a big virtual round of applause. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the audience and again soon. There we go. I found the applause button. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll, I'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Nice comments. And uh, yes, uh, Jared says, very nice presentation. Lots of good examples for consideration as we think about the future. Uh, John says, good dialogue. Well done. Uh, Robert says, digital transformation in the security space. Um, please do uh, keep those comments and questions coming. I am your champion. You are at an event, right? You are there. I'm here. We know that you're here. <laughs> you know, So you should feel that you're at an event. Feel, feel free to talk and, 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 and celebrate. Um, if you would like to post, um, we are suggesting RASConf as a hashtag. Um, it's the first time we've used it, but I think that would be uh, a good hashtag. And if, if you do use it, why would you use it? Well, we can then see what you've posted and promote what you've posted and, uh, and, and so on. And of course, yeah, Steve has very kindly put his email and the uh, handles in the chat function. So please do follow Steve and then, and then perhaps... Um, tweet him uh reflect on on what we've been what we've been uh, talking about uh, today now what we like to do with these forums especially in the wider format whether it's the dmv whether it's the europe forum whether it's the southwest forum or maybe the great lakes forum and we like to then have a response from people who are not working in robotics but they are corporate security professionals just like you and um, so let me bring our fantastic panelists up to the stage and then uh, i will i will give them an introduction uh, because I think this is an excellent uh, juncture to, to, to sort of jump uh, on board. So let me make sure we have everybody. Very good. 
And then also, if you if you can start your screen uh, as well, that then fantastic. Just make sure everybody is here. I like it. Uh, okay, okay. And just make sure you can start your screens. And Carlos, I've invited you as well. So just it, when 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 you're invited to be a panelist, if you just accept, and then you can jump on board. Anyway, what a great crowd! Uh, what a great crowd, Carlos. If you can if you can accept the uh, the the. the uh, the promotion, so to speak. Um, we are very pleased to be joined by Kelly Moy, Vice President, Security Operations North America at GM Financial. We're very pleased to be joined by Stephen Meinke, Corporate Security Manager, East and West Region at Nestle, Robert Facito, VP uh, Enterprise Resiliency, Physical Security Crisis Management at Fannie Mae, and Carlos Cabello, Director of Operations at Trident Security Services. Um, it's a real spectrum and real pleasure to have uh, on the panel. Um, how, how are you all doing? Have you enjoyed the session so far? Absolutely. I like it. I like it. And just incidentally, please keep uh, keep those comments coming in the audience. Um, welcome, Carlos. So um, here, here's, here's the big deal. Let's take a step back. When we talk about corporate security modernization, we're often talking about perhaps um, automation in some respects. Um, Robert, let's start with you. Let's, let's, let's take a step back. What does automation actually mean in the context of corporate security modernization? And what do we mean by corporate security modernization anyway? Because we want to get into the whole robotics topic, but, but, but let's frame it right first. So <clears throat> thank you. And uh, I really enjoyed the, the previous um, uh, topic. Steve did a nice job in, in laying out uh, the, you know, the, I guess the, the topic for the day. So uh, in terms of automation, it's, there are so many tools uh, that are out there and, and, and linking what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and leveraging technology uh, is, is so important because I think as, as Steve had mentioned, there's so many, there's only so many resources you can apply and there's so much that needs to be done. There's so many eyes, the cameras can only do so much and you need to be able to leverage automation capabilities integrate the various tools that uh, that are out there and available to us. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I can think of, you know, from a security perspective, just a, a simple example is um, uh, our badging, uh, the, uh, the turnstiles coming into the building and linking it with our emergency notification system. So, you know, automating that, you know, that capability where our emergency notification and the security system are talking to one another in the event of a, a, an emergency in the building, we have a very targeted approach on how we communicate to those people in the event of an evacuation or um, a workplace violence type of incident. That's one example of where we're able to kind of leverage technology and, and, and automate some of that capability. That's just, just the, the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other things that we can do. I mean, with the pandemic, there are many uh, things that uh, are out there in terms of contact tracing and, and monitoring the doors and, and uh, the turnstiles. I mean, it, it's, it's such a broad topic and there are so many places and, and different channels to go down in order to uh, enhance our ability as, uh, as we look at the security spectrum. I like that because... You know, that ties nicely into some of the conversations we've had at our corporate security modernization events. Um, but there are many vendors out there. I'm not talking about uh, vendors that we have here today, but there, there are vendors in general that, that rock up and they say, I will automate everything for you. And you think to yourself, well, what do you mean everything? What is it? What is, what is it I do? You don't understand what I do. And then what are you trying to automate? And they'll go, yeah, I'll do everything. And in fact, we need to push back a little bit. And it's, it, it's, it's not such a successful sales technique, I would hope. Um, but, but, but let's go to you, Kelly. Um, when there are lots of people out there just promising to automate everything, what do we specifically want to automate anyway? And, 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 and I'm thinking that the types of mundane tasks, you know, what, what is it that we want them to do? As a security practitioner, you know, we would like to take out the 
the the hands on if like the turnstiles uh, Linnell badging if you get a, a an automated report to your GSOC or your G6 saying hey somebody attempted to badge this area unauthorized or there was a piggybacking tying that that piggybacking into access to the work computers if if you disable their ability to log on to work because they didn't badge in through your turnstile or through your your secured layers of defenses, whether it's your door or turnstiles, we have both. Um, that would send a message that that person may not be authorized to be in the building. Um, so we're looking at technology that will automate the entrance process, make people follow rules without us having to constantly go to their leadership to say, hey, your person piggybacked in today, or hey, your person, you know, uh, walked in the door without badging and uh, if we take away their ability to log on the computer at that point, it's not us, it's a technology restriction, right? And anything we can do to stop being that barrier of, we don't want business to continue <laughs> because we're, you know, in, in, we had this on Saturday where a team member wanted in the building and she was late. Her husband bagged her in, who's a vice president, and he went home bagged her in and then she went and complained that it took her too long to get a badge to go to work. Well, that's deflection, right? And uh, a lot of that can be um, unencumbered with technology by making the technology work for you, as opposed to security being the, the iron hand all the time. So we're looking at that. Um, I know that's pretty common out there in the security world. Applying it is always our issue here. Fannie Mae, I'm sure you have the same issues I did. As a matter of fact, I met a vendor last night that works at Fannie Mae and has the same restrictions um, that you do because I found him blocking a door open to go in and out yesterday. Um, is We have cyber risks. You know, We have these layers of defense because we don't want people in our network, period, and it's full stop, right? Um, and it makes our job difficult because people like to circumvent our layers of defense. Um, and uh, I think the more technology we can use, the more AI, um, the more successful we'll be. And as a company, we are very focused on robotics. Uh, it, we have a whole department now geared towards nothing but uh, agility and robotics. And so we're all on board with that. They're actually teaching some of my GSOC folks how to be bot experts. Uh, so that we can look to how we can do create efficiencies within our JSOC. So it's all awesome. I love technology. I know it is our future. I know we are, I'm in the twilight of my career. So all the teams I work with, we're growing them to be more agile and more receptive of change. I know that was a long answer. Phil. No, sorry. no, no. It, set, it sets the scene. It's very good. And, and I think a lot of people are in a similar position, right? With, but I'm, I'm pleased we, we, we don't have to be an AI expert and we will actually get on to an AI expert, uh, you know, as, as, as we go on with this panel. Um, St Stephen, um, do we have to make the jump, if it is a jump, to robotics or can we not achieve much of this automation that we want to do with cameras? So I think, you know, it's a good point. Um, I think uh, most of the people on the panel will tell you that we get inundated with uh, salespeople trying to sell us all this technology. Uh, pretty much our inboxes get full. And, you know, I do take the time to try to go in and, and look at each of the technology to see if I can use it at my sites or at my facilities, for example, and see if it's something that might be useful. But for the cameras, you know, we use, uh, you know, multiple cameras at all of our locations and we have everything from factories to distribution centers throughout the U.S. And, you know, my number one responsibility is, you know, the um, safety of my employees. You know, I have over 50,000 employees here in the U.S. And, you know, the camera systems are great uh, only if they're maintained. You know, sometimes we have issues when we do our audits that some of the cameras are not functioning properly at my sites. They're not viewing the cameras at our sites. Uh, but there are a lot of benefits to the cameras. You know, uh, we put them in, you know, our areas that we see the, the most need for them, you know, uh, pedestrian points, guest visitors, uh, where our vehicles are coming in and out. Um, and they can alert us to a lot of things a lot of times, uh, you know, and then being able to capture historical footage is important if there's an incident that's discovered after the fact. 
So there is some wonderful technology out there with the cameras that can alert you to somebody, you know, just like our ring doorbell cameras that are ho- our homes. You know, if there's somebody, you know, that maybe we had an incident where somebody maybe jumped a fence one of our perimeter fences and it was immediately caught on a camera and alerted by the camera system to alert the security guards. So there is some wonderful technology out there. There's just a lot of technology and you really have to kind of go through it to figure out what's best and what can you use for your different sites and facility. Cause you definitely can be inundated with the amount of technology that is out there and not all of it's going to apply. So I think, you know, it's, you just got to kind of go through each individual company and see what they have to offer and see if you can use it. Yeah, you can you can imagine spin selling sitting there going, yeah, I'll automate that, and that, and that. Yeah, anything you say, I'm going to automate it. You know, <laughs> and that's that's not where we want to be. And um, I will get on to Doctor Almasen, but I'm conscious we got Carlos. Um, Carlos, can you hear me? Because Carlos is in. Yes, sir. I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, perfect. Well, I I, I want to include <clears throat> you because you know you represent, of course, the 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 guarding side, this you know the private security side. And that is really, really key because it's all well and good talking about robotics as applied to corporations that may or may not have budgets for things, right? But what about the the guarding side, the EP side? Um, what 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 do we, what do you think we want to automate? Well, I mean, we we talk. I mean, a couple of the of the speakers talked about all the things that they want to automate, and at the end of the day. We want to automate everything we can. We want to automate procedures and processes so we can dedicate those resources to something else and be a little bit more efficient. Um, that said, I wanted to go back to the initial presentation when we were talking about the hospital example, um, which is great. But I think the main point, we all wanted to go to the future, automate, include robotics. And we have some examples. You know, We have the robots already in a limited function, more of a kind of a marketing thing and perhaps recording video, and they might have to weigh uh, communication, but you still somebody to come in and react or, or mitigate that situation in real time. So that's where, where the guarding comes. And I know there's a balance between maybe you reduce the amount of guards, you're trying to save some money, put it on rates, but the reality is you still have to pay for that robot. You have to pay for the software, for the implementation. So the reducing the guard savings might go to that unless you have great planning, great vision for the future, and you build that into the program. So there's some, some pluses and minuses there. Uh, all, in all, all in all good, you know, just like having uh, drones and everything else. Yeah, they save on, on manning, but you still have to pay for that technology, for the implementation, for the software, for the back end. So, so I don't think there's immediate savings, but if it's, if it's program, and, and implement it as a, as a full program from the beginning, then, then yes, you can budget for it. Um, uh, the example was great. I think the main challenge to that, take the automation uh, part out of the way, the robotics to, to increase that. I think the main challenge is educating the customers and, and, and the rest of our fellow professionals to be able to be open to including that as part of the security program. Because when you talk to customers, I'm telling you that from the, from the guarding perspective, they're like, ah, oh, you know, I just, you know, my customers want a person. They want a person that runs to that parking lot. They want a person that walks with that person. They want a person in the lobby that when something happens, they can move from point A to B and, and be there. And they're very skeptical of it. So just a little bit of education. There's resistance to change as always. But I think if we work on that piece, then we can make progress. I like that. And, that. and that perception piece, I think we'll, 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 we will get into that. Um, Dr. Almasan, um, welcome. Let me come to you now, because I think this is a prime time to say, what about the promise of AI in all of this? Because doesn't robotics inherently need some ML or AI? Or, or do, you know, would a robot exist if it's not actually independent? Um, can, are we there yet? Hi, Philim. Thank you so much for inviting me for being here. Yes, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. The cameras and the ability to use smart cameras that can leverage uh, AI, ML, deep learning, um, it's becoming key for virtually any kind of uh, needs, not only for 
um, I would say marketing and advertising and, and promoting or identifying objects in real time even for self driving, for example, but now because in the context of security and safety, I think cameras and the leveraging, leveraging smart cameras that can identify facial recognition, identify uh, humans versus the, an animal or, or even a moving object, I think all of them gives uh, significant um, help for the technology people to ensure higher ways to secure the premises, higher ways and, and quicker ways to identify individuals, actions of the individuals, as well as to um, use that information in real time to identify patterns in, and behaviors of, of those, pretty much predict when, when something could happen, either because we want to predict the behavior of a customer in a store, or want to predict the behavior of, um, of, of a burglar that may actually action later on, or to, to understand uh, what could be the behavior of customers in, in a facility. So all of this can be handled extremely well now with the technologies that exist uh, on the market. I agree with Stephen. Um, we have to be careful because uh, there are a lot of products right now. Everybody sells something and everybody uh, provides uh, uh, um, the buzzwords, AI, ML, but uh, not all of the products actually uh, provide a quality uh, to meet those expectations. I know looking at the big players on the cloud, um, and I, uh, I think Carlos mentioned uh, briefly uh, drones. Uh, I know AWS just is an in-home robot that actually uh, walks in the house and checks uh, for noises and, and, and identifies uh, potential new faces if somebody joins and triggers alert. Now in the future, this kind of robotics will become available for um, walking on the streets, and that's also going to increase safety and security. Uh, I, again, AI ML deep learning will continue to play a key role, not just for the safety recognition, but also in the technology world, because uh, we are concerned about funding, about money, about how much we are going to pay for the solutions. The better the solutions are, the easier we can actually uh, store this information. You are talking about um, uh, lots and lots of gigabytes, petabytes of data that has to be stored and having AI enables us to understand which data is valuable, which data is not valuable, and therefore we can save a lot of money and also make our processes more efficient by leveraging only the significant data. It's pretty much use AI to extract the signal out of the noise and make our uh, environment more safer. And that, and that is a key point, isn't it? Because for all of the data that these robots will be hoovering up, something has to happen to it. It needs to become actionable. But before I do that, I think many people will have seen, at least in conventions, a big robot that walks around and it is billed as a robot. Yet it is not a robot. And when the event organizers sign, uh, sign the waiver, they, they agree to not tell anybody that it's not a robot. Now, because I'm not telling you what robot this is not, then I feel completely uh, devoid of guilt, right? How would a layperson start to understand if a robotic solution has AI? And this is a wider question, Dr. Amasan, about how, do, how, how does a non-AI expert identify AI? Well, it is really difficult to identify if um, a specific, uh, uh, let's say, humanized uh, object, uh, it is actually a smart, a smart object that can actually uh, identify and make decisions, or is just a, a rule-based solution that actually provides uh, with uh, um, uh, some support, some help for the customer. The, the, those uh, robots that you, de you describe that are part of now most conferences, and even if you go on, I remember on a cruise line, I, I, I was welcomed by one of those robots to help me to check in. And it was a very nice experience, but those robots have uh, different features. And, and again, it is almost impossible for someone to understand how smart is this robot. On the other hand, uh, while these robots ensure support and, and sometimes safety security, it also, they also can pose some um, uh, problems for, when it comes to uh, fairness, depending what kind of support and how it's engaging with you. 
It could be problems with uh, uh, privacy, as we all know. Um, in other countries, uh, this kind of cameras not only ensure safety and, and, and uh, security, but also take away from all of us our private life and our private uh, uh, actions. So it's, it's really important to, um, you know, for these companies that make use of such robots, they have to figure out ways to disclose ahead of the time this kind of mm. information is stored, this kind of information is taken away from you, and also give an opportunity to people uh, to accept or deny such uh, type of uh, interactions. And um, I don't think we have a strong, um, um, I think, uh, legislation to support this. This, this, this technology evolves way faster than, <clears throat> than the legislation in, in, in the world. And um, <clears throat> I just read a few days ago, uh, the first uh, legislation, the first guidance, and hopefully legislation will come uh, when it comes to machine learning for <clears throat> robotics inside of medical devices. I think that's the first to be regulated because it poses immediate uh, uh, risks uh, to the patient. So I think in the future we'll see more and more regulation to provide support for this kind of uh, problem. I like it. And, and there's a lot of support in the audience, Sam. I'll go through the comments a bit later. There's so many comments. Um, Robert, let's then take one step back, though. Robert, can't we just throw people at the problem? I mean, surely the labor squeeze is a short term labor squeeze and eventually they'll all come running back. Um, you know, can't we just throw people at the problem, Robert? Um, yes and no. Um, I think to to Steve Stephen's point earlier, um, I think, you know, with the cameras uh, and, and the tools that we currently have in place, um, I think, you know, there are products out there that help us correlate the data and data analytics plays a key part in all of this. Um, so you're going to need some smart people to help you do the things you need to do. But uh, the type of people that you're talking about throwing at it is, uh, are there, you know, more security guards? Yeah, you can always throw security guards. You can, you can get the national guard to surround your buildings and, and, uh, and, and provide top level white glove security. You can do that, but um, you have to think smart about it and leverage uh, the technology and the tools that are available. Um, the cameras can be used for so many different things. There are other sensors that can be leveraged and then pulling all of those data points together, correlate the data and give us information to help us do our job better is probably not, the, I wouldn't say it's the easiest thing depending on how uh, leverage your technology, but it is a way forward to um, leverage technology, the whole digital transformation approach, and then not just throwing people at it. I mean, I like the whole robotics. We at Fannie Mae were looking at robotics. We found a company uh, that you know, uh, kind of blew us away. And in the end, it, it fell a little bit short. Uh, for what we were trying to achieve. So we're a few years away from really strong uh, capabilities. But um, uh, throwing people at it, depending on what you want to achieve, uh, if it's just a brute force effort, yes. If it's um, uh, leveraging uh, technologists to do the data analytics and the data correlation to make the smaller group more effective, that's another approach. So it, it depends on what type of people we're talking about. Um, and uh, that will improve our capability uh, as an organization to provide that level of safety and security uh, for our employees. Well, Robert, maybe because you mentioned it, I know it's a bit of a segue, but I think we'd all be interested to hear a little bit about your experience considering to implement robots, even though maybe it's not where you want it at the moment, but, you know, what what can you tell us about that process? Well, it was it was pretty it was pretty amazing, um, and what they what those robots can do they can maneuver through the buildings the the elevators because they're integrated to the elevators uh, they can move about the building open doors uh, all of that uh, they do air quality testing temperature testing you know they they never call in sick. Um, you don't have to worry about attrition there. Um, 
and um, and they can with the machine learning and the AI they can constantly get better. And what we were thinking and looking at and the capabilities, where I mean, as they move about the building in our pantries in within in the locations, they can do things from a facilities perspective to, to take a look at inventories and report on that. Um, they can you know find the leak on the floor and report that. Um, Again, the, the routine stuff, and that's what we were excited about. But they they can't perform CPR, so they'll never replace the human. They will only be able to augment and take on some of the the routine repetitive stuff, um, and it makes the the guards it improves and raises the level of of security guard that you have to do more and focus on different things. So um, the the robots that we looked at. Um, where it was pretty awesome. If 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 they could have delivered what we what they said they could, we would have we would have been there. And it was very very cost effective. And um, but we're we're still a few years away. But the 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 benefits are tremendous. And then it's but then it's it's a whole cultural shift for the employees because I think uh, John mentioned something about privacy or somebody mentioned something about privacy which was a big concern. And we had to get through our legal folks to, to talk about, because are they always listening? They have the vid video capturing, you know, there are all privacy issues that, uh, that would be, uh, need to be addressed as part of that. And we were able to do that um, and get sign off by, by our privacy folks, but mm. uh, it would still be a very huge concern. If you're in the building at seven o'clock at night and a robot came up to you and said, you know, swipe your badge here to just to make sure that you're good. And, and they're linked to our command center. Um, you know, the, 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 the robot company provided some videos on how all that stuff worked. And it's definitely a cultural shift in how to behave with, with robots moving about your organization. Uh, but um, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. We can leverage the tools that we currently have today using technology to improve and enhance our capabilities well i love it and you give examples of what they might not be able to do and, and in fact doug who asked a question at the very beginning um you know uh, suggested they they don't shovel sidewalks either right so they they're not going to be able to do that now doug asked a question which i feel we can put to the panel right but i think it's better for the next panel only because the next panel is more technically um uh, aware of what robots could do but Doug does raise the question, the $1 million question, how will robots access doors and elevators? How will they integrate with access control systems? Um, which, which I know you've alluded to, but I want to save that, Doug, for the next one. And Athman comes up with a nice idea. Maybe every AI has to have a backup human, uh, which, which I think is kind of, kind of ironic. Um, Kelly, let's, let's come to you again, because you know, if we can't just throw people at every situation because of a variety of reasons, um, where where would you say robotics could augment your security professionals rather than replace them? You know, I work for GM Financial, so our mothership is General Motors. I know our futuristic vehicles, the, the automation there, um, the self-driving vehicles, the all electrification of vehicles. I see that that being integrated, I, I think, in our security platform in the next five years. And I, I have no vision of that. I just am aware of the ability that these things have to do right now. They're delivering pizzas, right? I mean, in San Francisco, everyone, there's several vehicles out there right now that drive without humans. Um, it's coming. So we're, we're ready for that. Will that take away my security staff? No, that'll add to, I have mobile patrols now with a body in it. I think that will just, uh, again, enhance, uh, like Robert said, and, and augment what we already have in place. Um, you know, drones are great and, and robots are great. And I love your uh, story about wanting to do the robots, but it never replaces the human um, uh, person when their earbuds are stolen off their desk or, you know, they, they want to go in the break room and they have a leak. They're not going to go tell the robot, hey, the coffee maker is leaking. But we know that that human is important. And I also equate everything we've talked to today as a, as a consumer to none of us wanted self-checkouts five years ago. All of us hated the idea of self-checkouts. 
Now I seek out the self-checkout. I don't want to have to deal with a cashier, right? Um, so look where we went from in five years with that. I, I feel like we're going to continue to enhance our security platforms. I think uh, we are going to continue to enhance. There's going to take leaders like on this panel and the vendors that are, that are talking about this to continue talking. Uh, I think it will we'll improve. I, I think the robots will change. Um, and, and yesterday, looking at AEDs and testing them when I was in one of my locations, it's a lot of task that I think can be augmented with some technology. Uh, and it's coming. Mm. And it's coming. Hey, well, Kelly, can I, can I just add one thing? Sure. So, so just a funny story. I had to get a hold of somebody yesterday from a, from a company, from a security camera company. I'm not going to mention it. Uh, reference to some billing questions and I could not for the life of me for over two hours get a human being to speak to because they couldn't solve my problem through their, through their electronic telephone and I actually got to the point where I had to download the app sign up for everything to even try to talk to a human being and that didn't even work and I wound up just getting frustrated and gave up so another thing where it, you can't always take the human element out of everything. It's it, it, sometimes it's very, yes. you need to speak to a person and I will just leave it like that. You're a hundred percent right. Uh, it is so frustrating. We, we have bots for everything. You know, you call, you press three to talk, you press two for your account information. I mean, there's not a company out there. How many of us go right to the zero uh, or the nine to talk to a human? We, we, that's not ever going to change, I don't think. I, I think it's always going to be, in our lifetime anyway, something where we're looking for that human interaction to solve our problems. And especially with cameras or technology, that's not something that can be fixed over the phone, right? You, you need to have someone to talk to. And I'm sure you have to pay for a service to have a technician respond to you. Um, as we do, we have to buy the enhanced um, programs to have a service technician available for us for cameras. So, so Stephen, yeah, on, on that point, in, in, in fact, is there not a, a bit of a tricky situation, much as why, uh, why the military might not um, have something as a service from an external contractor that's not one of their own primes? If something goes wrong and the service gets pulled, are, are we not fearful that if we've rented a robot and it's like, well, you need the new update, I'm not giving you the new update because whatever, or maybe you bought your robot from a European country and suddenly they're not playing ball or something like that. Is, is there not a danger if we rent robots compared to if we have bought them? But then there's a big overhead in buying them. Um, how, how can we balance that? And I know there's no magic answer, Stephen, but I, but I thought I'd ask you. No, I think, you know, you have to really do your homework and, and, and you know, do your research. And, and, and if you're going to purchase one of these, uh, you know, pieces of equipment or this technology, you really have to look at, you know, reviews, their customer service, you know, um, you know, just dig as much, you know, reach out to, I always say when I, if I'm going to purchase anything, I say, what, for example, where else is this technology? Because I want to reach out to the company that is already using it and talk to their security people and say, hey, do you like it? Are you having issues with it? If you are having issues with it, what are those issues? You know, So I think it's really important that you just do as much homework as possible and get as much information before you make that commitment to purchase that technology. So like I said, I think at the end of the day, number one goal is to protect our employees. I think you can, there's lots of technology out there that is great, you know, for example, you know, like I said, my goal is to build you know, layers and layers of security, you know, to make it harder and harder for somebody to penetrate one of my facilities and then, but also make it as smooth and, you know, the transition for my employees to get into my facilities. I don't want them to be held up because of the technology. I want them to still be able to come into work without any issues, um, you know, but I still want to, so it's a, it's a delicate balance because you, you want to, you know, build those layers, you know, to make it harder for somebody else, but you don't want to make it difficult for your employees because they're going to get frustrated if they have to do multiple things to get into your facility. So, 100%. you know, so like, for example, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, oh, you know, we don't want to have weapons in our facility. So let's get metal detectors. I'm like, metal detectors are not going to work because now every employee is going to have to stop, empty their pockets. But there is technology out there that is using AI that 
you know, you can walk right through. It'll identify if you have a person has a weapon, but it won't pick up on the laptop, the cell phone, the keys, the, you know, so there are things you can get to make it easier for your employees to get through. So it's more seamless, but also does the job of identifying a threat coming into your property. But, but Stephen, I'd be interested in a futurology sense, what of the layers you're talking of is robotics going to do? Is, is it an additional round around the facility? Is it an additional uh, sweep for weapons with non-ionizing radiation? Um, if, you, if you were to build it into your strategy, what is the layer that you'd apply it to? Well, I think it, it, each site for me is different. So I think it depends on, you know, if I'm, I'm looking at a corporate office, for example, you know, where, you know, I have occupied 10 floors of a high rise or do I have one of my factories, which is all on maybe one or two levels. And, you know, I have a much larger property, you know, with a larger perimeter, you know, and, you know, multiple points of entry or multiple access points to get access, you know where trucks maybe come up, c come and drop off supplies. And I have an employee entrance. I have a guest or visitor entrance where, like I said, in a corporate office, I might have one single point of entry for everybody. So I think it all depends on looking at the overall, you know, site and then doing obviously your site risk assessment, you know, figure out where, you know, I'm vulnerable, you know, every site should do a, you know, a site risk assessment and then applying that technology to where you think, you know, you might need it. I think it's really, I don't think that's, it's hard to answer with just where you're going to apply yeah. it. So I think a lot of it's going to depend on the individual site, you know, what you're trying to, what you're trying to protect. And it should probably come from that way around. I have this, it needs to be protected. What shall I use? Maybe one of these, as opposed to, hi, Stephen, I come to automate everything that you could ever possibly want to automate. Don't worry, I'll sort it out. Which, which you know, people, you'd, you'd think that sales pattern has disappeared, but it hasn't. Um, Robert, what then can we hope to achieve with a forum such as this? Because, you know, originally, originally, I did think, you know what, I could probably have an entire half a day uh, with examples of robots zooming around corporate security. And it's not quite there yet, right? It's not quite there yet. Um, yet there are robots that we do experience in our everyday life that don't look like robots. Uh, Kelly mentioned the robo phones. Um, Maybe there are, you know, social media influencers out there that use a little drone to video themselves. Maybe that could become a robot. I don't know. What would you like to see us using very soon? What, what are the types of things that would be actually handy, Robert? Well, I mean, you know, security threats come in so many, so many different forms. So, you know, it all depends on where you think your, your most significant vulnerabilities are. And that's where you look to automate or, or implement uh, the robotics. But again, going back to Stephen's earlier point, you know, really good camera technology can add so much value depending on placement um, and, and capability. Um, that it, it really helps. And then being able to leverage the, the data analytics that come out of that. I mean, we're, we're looking at, we've implemented facial recognition and, and, um, and I, I don't think that's a form of robotics, but it is part of, uh, of uh, AI. And, um, you know, we're looking at frictionless entry and exit from buildings with facial recognition. Uh, we have it on some specific uh, high secured doors uh, and we're going to see how that goes before we put it on the uh, turnstiles. Um, uh, in terms of expanding beyond that, um, uh, you know, there are, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, or, or it was mentioned before, um, robotics, there are different forms of robotics, but um, what we had looked at before would have been uh, a, a, a huge step forward into the future. I was so excited about it and um, the capabilities, you know, imagine having a device going around doing, uh, you know, air quality testing real time all the time. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, threats around quality of air. Um, uh, just, you know, with, with the attrition rates that we're dealing with, you know, those types of things. But, but you know, security professionals, 
there's the physical aspect, right? There's workplace violence, active shooter type stuff. Robots uh, will come in and as, as you all know, right, to, to disarm a, 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 um, an, incendiary, an incendiary device or some sort of explosive, you know, we, the, the police uh, use uh, robots today to, to go in and, and take, uh, take those, uh, those devices out. Um, those, that's a good example of a robot. But for us, for looking at the buildings and keeping an eye on, on you know, what's going on um, for contact tracing, I kind of mentioned before, which is an important part around the pandemic. There's, um, uh, we're, we've just finished a, an executive threat assessment where we're searching dark web and, and social media for threats against our executive leadership, our board members. There's some enhanced, um, not robotics, but automation to, to do those search searches and provide those alerts when when some uh, a threat comes up to one of our executives and how we take care of that how we action it but that technology is is more important than than robotics down the road again it's it's all about what you're trying to solve for and come up with the right solution but uh but data analytics capturing that information using the automation i think is is really more of the here today the now that we can leverage and raise our game across the board. Uh, but I think, Steve, you had mentioned yesterday the, the magnetometer type of, of devices that you have for coming in the buildings or whatever. That's also a, a nice a nice to have uh, or maybe a need to have depending on what the situation is. But it all depends on what we're trying to solve for, where we see our vulnerabilities or weaknesses. And that's where we're going to put the emphasis on the automation, the robotics, the whatever. So everybody has different challenges uh, and there are different solutions for everybody. So it's all about what you're trying to solve for. Love it. And in the audience, we've had some lovely comments. Um, far too many, in fact, for me to read out all at once. John says, it seems the question of what is it you want to do must be really looked at before uh, moving on uh, on this topic. Um, uh, Atman says, very interesting panel, very educational. Um, Patrick suggests that a key component of lead reading technology, even beyond real robotics, is a more capable human security element, the better career path, because, of course, that is another question which we don't have time for, but we could go into. How on earth are we going to have people moving up the career ladder if we say, you know what, the first job that you have is CSO, <laughs> you know, because the rest of it is done by robots. Uh, so we have to look at how the career path uh, looks uh, looks like. And, and that might mean that we parachute more people in from law enforcement and military and undo some of the work we've done to try and elongate the profession. I don't know. Um, and uh, we, yeah, lots of lots of other lovely, lovely comments. Um, Kelly and then Stephen, final thoughts. Uh, what, what do you hope we might be able to achieve today? You know, I, I, I really appreciate the feedback and, and the commentary from this panel. Um, we all seem to have the same, we're all nodding north and south on, on each other's comments. Uh, it goes back to doing the risk assessment, Steve, right? You have to do that first to know what you're defending against. We also, Robert, use a, uh, a geofencing to monitor dark web. We have alerts uh, that come to my investigations team as well as my GSOC. So we from a robotic standpoint, Fallon, we have to look at, that's a boots on the ground proposition right now, where we're looking more at, uh, you know, a more higher level approach of a preemptive, uh, predictive type of strategy and security. Our job is to protect it or defend um, and hopefully never have it happen, right? I mean, we look at our C-suites and I love the facial recognition in key areas. Robert, I'm going to actually talk to you about that later um, as because we have to integrate our C-suite into believing technology is the future, right? And not that's not always an easy sell um, as everybody on this panel knows. It's a, it's a change is hard, and especially when it costs money. But to me, having a robot in a building isn't something that's going to help us prevent or predict uh, security risk right now. I, I think we're looking as a leadership panel at external preventative, even internal preventative. How do we keep it out of the workplace um, and identify it 
prior to it becoming an actual live incident. Did I nail that, Stephen and Robert? I, you, know? <laughs> you, well you did. And yeah. I, I, I'll just add on top of that, you know, I think that there is a lot of technology out there and I think you just have to, you, you know, do your research. And if it's something that's going to help you and your facility or your company, you just got to do your, you know, really good homework. But I will say this, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, for me, like I said, I've said it a million times, workplace violence incident in the U.S., active shooter incident is my greatest fear and protecting my employees. I've just spent a lot of money. I would rather, you know, give all my employees really, really good active shooter training, which I've done, you know, uh, whether it's like a 45 minute, 50 minute e-learning module, as well as some virtual training, then have a robot in a building that maybe alerts me to an active shooter. Because I think, you know, if you've looked at a lot of the, uh, the stories 100%. where people uh, at, at Kroger, we had the recent workplace shootings at the grocery stores, which affects our business. You know, you listen to the people and they said, my company provided me training that was beneficial and helped me, you know, do something that saved my life or somebody else's life. So exactly. I would rather provide that to my employee because I think they're going to get more out of it than a robot roaming a floor saying, oh, there's an active shooter uh, on, on, you know, they're still going to have to call law enforcement. They're still going to have to have the police and, you know, and fire, you know, come to eliminate that threat where the robot's not going to be able to eliminate that threat. They might be able to notify me of that threat. But at the end of the day, everybody has a cell phone. My employees have cell phones. They're going to be able to communicate that just as well. So that's just my two cents. I, I still think there is a benefit to robots and, and the technology, but I, I just don't, Right now, I don't see it. Maybe in the future, a little bit more. Uh, but there, I think there are definitely some. You know, like I said, our company is using robots all on our factory floors to 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 to, to speed up the process to produce food, for example. So there is we're using it, but from a security standpoint, I just don't see the benefit of having that robot. And I saw the same technology that Robert did. I, I looked at it; it was pretty amazing that the robot was roaming around the hall at like two a.m. and somebody swiped their badge on it. And I said, "Oh, that's pretty neat." But I'm like. Can I use that here? Is it worth it here? You know, so you have to do your homework and you have to do your research. So I'll just leave it like that. Right, right. And my last comment will be uh, something I say to my people over and over and over and over again, people over process. Our job is people and, and the process enhances and augments, but we have to keep in focus that the people are way more important than the process. And I have to tell our guards that all the time, right? If they're so robotic in what they do, that, that they'll do a task 100%. But when somebody comes in with a badge question, it's like deer in the headlights. Um, so we have to reinforce that people part um, in our world, in my world. There we go. I think that is a great place to end it on because you know what? We are not robotics experts. We are simply the end customer saying, come on, we need this. We don't need that. What is it we need to solve for? Solve for X uh, as opposed to the other way around. Um, John says, great discussion. Jared says, uh, good points. Robots uh, serve a purpose. Uh, right now, it seems like they can help with automation detection and customer service, but the human element still needs uh, to be there. Mohammed says, really enjoying this. Very informative uh, from a security perspective. So Robert, Stephen, Kelly, and previously Dr. John and Carlos, thank you very much for, for, for this. We hope to see you in the audience. Please give them a big virtual round of applause. Uh, which uh, which I found the applause button for. So it's been, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you. I'll put you back in the audience. Thanks everyone for the for the final session. I'll see you in the audience. Thank you. Love it. Okay, fantastic news. Great to have that uh, wonderful uh, panel, and you know it's great to have a big spectrum. Uh, thanks, Athman. Thanks, Paul. Please keep your comments coming. And if you are going to uh, tweet about it or LinkedIn post it, you know, maybe screenshot or whatever, please. I'm suggesting RASConf. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 a good it's a good uh, hashtag to use. Why would you use a hashtag that I have uh, suggested? Well, it means that we can all see what we've all posted and help promote uh, each other's posts, um, which is great because you are at an event. You should feel that you're at an event. This is live. Uh, and so, and so, yeah, please feel free to keep me as your champion. Now, we've had a look at what uh, the high level picture could achieve, and we've had a look at what the uh, end customer might, in fact, want. Uh, now, let's look at the future of what might be on offer. And, and so, let me bring our fantastic panelists to the 
floor and then I'll give them a great introduction. Um, and, and, and I'm really excited about this because obviously I can really let rip on my, on my, my futurology, my, my, my ideas about what is in the art of the possible. Um, we are very, very pleased to welcome David Bolson, Director of Space Security Risk and Resilience at HEO Robotics. We're very pleased to welcome Mark Falmer, President and Chief Operating Officer, Robotic Assisted Devices, RAD. And we're very pleased to welcome Will Plummer, CSO at Ray Secure. It's a pleasure to have you all on. How are you doing? Good morning. Good to be Great. here. It's good, isn't it? It's nice. And, and you know what? Short and succinct this mm. entire conference is, I think in the years to come, we can make it longer with bigger case studies of things that have actually been applied and, and we can get a, a flavor of, 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 of what people are doing uh, even more. Um, I have a series of questions which I'd love to ask you. And, but, but perhaps, first of all, if I ask each of you to introduce yourselves and give us a flavor of where you're coming from on the robotics topic, because it, it, it's not necessarily that obvious, it, you know, on the, on the face of it, if I just read out your job titles, um, I know, but I think it'd be nice for the audience. Um, David, let's start with you. Welcome. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your organization and, 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 and why robotics and, and, and remote robotics in particular are, are, are very interesting? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, no, first of all, thank you for uh, for hosting. What a wonderful event. What a great uh, title as well. Robotics as a service. I think this is going to be a big sector that uh, a lot of people are going to want to be um, enjoying and participating in over the next few years. So, um, as you mentioned, my name is David Bolson. I'm the uh, director of risk at uh, HEO Robotics, and we are we are a space company. So, I think uh, you know, for, for many people, this might be kind of a, a, a new a new area. Um, but I think once I start to talk about robotics and operating in space, you'll realize that there really is no other solution. Humans are really bad at breathing uh, in a vacuum. So we have to use robots uh, to go into space. Um, my background is actually in a mixture of government and law enforcement. You mentioned in the previous panel that you know, a lot of the security industry, particularly the high levels, come from a military or defense background. You know, and I think I think that 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 gives some insight into the threat modeling that goes on often in the security industry. In space, um, all of our equities on Earth um, have some footprint uh, up in up in orbit. So, power, electricity, gas, um, military activities, maneuvering. Um, communications, um, particularly in areas that are remote. So if you think about um, rural locations with no fixed infrastructure, almost all of that is based on satellite communications. And therefore, the security of that domain is really important to life on, on, on Earth for us all. Um, the probably next question you've got in your head, though, is what are the threats in space? It's space. It's empty, right? You know, unless... Independence Day starts happening and we have some, you know, alien invasion. Um, but actually, there's a lot going on in, in an Earth orbit um, that, that needs uh, space security. Um, most, most kind of notably is, is the debris problem, which probably is sort of less interesting, you know, here. Um, but, it's, but it's definitely a risk that pieces of junk or pieces of um, disused spacecraft are just flying around and could easily knock out uh, a system. But there are, unfortunately, adversary nations uh, who have um, interest in, in space. And there is a potential for either deliberate or miscalculated um, input in space where um, the things that we rely on, the things that we, we use every day to have a peaceful existence down here on Earth could, could be used in some nefarious way. Lastly, there's also the problem of, of espionage and intelligence collection, which is kind of a gray zone in between the two. So those things are usually passive. They're usually um, security threats that are only really monitored by governments. And for most companies and commercial institutions, those security threats are seen as fairly esoteric. But actually, if those are representative of the privacy and, and, and integrity of your customers or the potential for spoofing and jamming, if you think of a, a space system that we all use, every single one of you probably used uh, Google Maps in the last 
you know, a few days, maybe if you haven't been out of the house for a while, but um, we've all been, you know, indoors for a long time, but, you know, GPS is, is a fundamental to, to navigation and, and positioning on earth. Uh, and, and there are unfortunately actors out there um, who jam, spoof, trying to um, mess with it. So the answer, uh, of course, and, and just sort of bringing back to the, the point at hand is, is robots. And so HEO Robotics, um, we're a startup. We have 25 uh, robots, uh, for one better word. Um, you can think of these as, as, as very high altitude drones, if, if you, if you want to kind of imagine what, what we're talking about here. So these can fly around space um, and, and visually um, and with other sensors. And again, it was on the last panel, we talked about, you know, cameras as, as, as kind of a, a proxy for data uh, in, in lots of different ways. So that data could be visual, but it could also be another uh, um, radio spectrum. And we can understand threats to satellites and understand whether the things I just talked about, whether they be accidental, the, the debris or, or deliberate um, malice through some national security concerns, um, we can try and understand if, if they're a problem. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how all of that fits into the bigger picture of automation and robotics. But, but I think it's, it's a really interesting domain and, and one that, you know, this, 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 this dalliance between human effort, um, what it would take to do things manually, you know, fly up there and take a look and um, the, the sending a fleet of drones uh, really, really comes into the fore. So uh, that's mm. my piece. Thank you for bearing with me. I like that. No, but you see, that paints a picture because we've just, you know, today been thinking about robots that look like the non-ionizing drone uh, in in an airport. That you know, uh, we've been thinking about it, but but actually, we there's been there's been talk of other types of robots, including UAVs, including uh, smaller devices, um, and and so this panel is great because we have a spectrum. Um, now I will come to you, Mark, because I, I I know I know I know I know you'll you'll tie this all together. But Will, welcome. Uh, obviously, you're very much on the ground, and I know I know race secure. You know, is, is very much concerned about male uh, security. Um, but but some of the work you're doing, especially with that not ionizing radiation, to to discover uh, different types of threats, um, it, it is certainly very interesting. So, what perspective do you come at this uh, uh, from? So uh, my background, like we just talked about a little bit ago, is military. I did a bunch of time on the bomb squad working with robots. And it's, it's interesting to watch the evolution of what happened when I joined EOD in 1997, what we had that was 10 years old at that point, to when I retired in 2019, the difference. But effectively, they weren't anything but long-range tools. They don't think for themselves. All they do is process data and return it back. Um, what we're seeing and what we're having a lot of interaction with, with our clients is they are buying robots, they are buying sensor suites and systems that go through their facilities. And that's exactly what they're using as is a sensor suite. So when that data comes back and we can put things like our system, uh, we just did a pretty good thing with the GSX with that, where they took a fault or took a, an alert and then responded with a robot. And it solved the problem, no human interaction other than the decision making process on the upstream side. Um, and we're seeing a lot more of that. A lot of the, the questions that have been posed today, um, people are, some are saying, nope, I need to throw a human being at it. And others are saying, I'd, I'd rather not. Um, a lot of the physical security threats, you don't want a human being standing there. And while you can gather data and continue to pull it back and then give it to a decision maker, you end up with a very informed decision that helps somebody mitigate a threat. Um, and to be honest with you, a lot of the times it's false positive. So instead of wasting time with a human being that has to um, approach a possible threat. You reduce that false positive without ever putting a human being in possible harm's way, and it's a win-win for for everybody involved. I like that, and 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 of course, relating it back to the EOD and you know bomb squad and and, and things like that, that that puts it firmly into perspective because you're. You 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 don't want to be there, right? No, you don't. Um, it's the last place you want to be. That's why that's why everybody made robots. Yeah, um, and 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 one of one of our good uh, frequent uh, workshop leaders on CIEDs and 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 so on uh, sort of talks a lot about the mentality to eradicate everything else from your mind, um, 
which <laughs> sounds quite robotic to me. Um, and and so and so a prime candidate. I like that. Um, Mark, let's then come to you, and then I'll, I'll kick off with my my sort of my questions. Um, how should we then better understand the landscape in which robotics are deployed? Um, because because we've seen this landscape, it could be in space, could be on the bomb squad, could be mail security, could be in the mall. How should we understand the threat landscape in which we're we're, we're operating now? Yeah, great, uh, great question, Fellowman. And, you know, by way of, of, of quick introduction, you know, uh, robotic assistance devices, most of you heard Steve speak this morning, but we're, we're not in space, you know, we're, uh, which is really neat. I, I think I could have listened to David just about all day, but, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're down at earth and we're really looking at the point of view of digital transformation, saying how are the services delivered today and what can we do uh, differently in and around that? And I love the, the, the comments about the, uh, from the previous panel of saying, you know, let's stay away for, from technology from, for technology's sake. You know, I mean, let's not just go explore some gizmos and fun stuff, but to, to Will's point is, you know, where can we use this technology to keep people safe, right? And, and it's not a be all and end all, absolutely. I don't think you can roll out a, roll out a fleet of robots and just kind of, you know, remove all the humans and, uh, and, and, and make sure that the, the, the corporation's assets, whether that be people or product or, 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 or physical assets, uh, be safe. So it's part of an overall uh, security program. And, and, and the way that I look at it on a day to day is, you know, which things can we uh, use and do uh, from an autonomous point of view, from an automated point of view that will allow for, you know, some of those other interactions and in, um, to be done by, you know, more qualified people, better developed people uh, that uh, that have more skills and, and, and the right skills to appropriately you know, kind of answer and interact with that, uh, that situation. And, and it's really a mix, right? It's a mixture of the, the soft skills and the technology uh, that's, uh, that's out there. But then Mark, as we, as we heard from Steve this morning as well, you know, is the main promise of the, the heralded robotic solution era, which, which is upon us, right? Is the real promise remote operations or are we, are we missing the point? Could 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 it not be remote, but our buddy? It could be an augment. Um, I, I I know. Yeah, the answer is going to be oh, it's somewhere in between. Right, but but it, 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 is it is it the remote proposition fundamentally that we're talking about? To, to me, in a lot of cases, I mean, yes, the, the real answer is somewhere in between. But it's autonomous first. It's robotic first. It's let's rely on that very basic finding the needle in a haystack looking at the entire haystack right from an autonomous point of view and then when we find the needle you know interacting specifically with that incident and you can do that from 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 just about anywhere so you know again to to, to will's comment about you know taking the human out of direct harm's way right from uh, for, for, from a situation and, and managing that remotely and then you ask yourself you know if i have one human resource you know taking care of maybe one lobby area right i mean you think about very you know current everyday sort of practice security officer in a lobby well can't you have one security officer for multiple you know multiple lobbies still interacting with people and now not just having to vet okay that person's supposed to be there person's not supposed to be there because how how can you do that let's have the device do a lot of that pre-screening sort of first step autonomously and then push to remote for some of that interaction. Now, as you go through escalation, you definitely need some on-site, right? I mean, I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we said, hey, we're going to deploy again, deploy this fleet of fleet of devices and and not ever have to interact with the human being again. I don't I, I don't think we're there yet. I like that. Uh, David, you, you're going to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to uh, sort of echo Mark's point on the on the scale. And I think you know, I get I get asked this question all the time around um, augmentation, or you know, is it coming for people's jobs? And I worked in uh, you know artificial intelligence, and then robotics. And I, I think you know, again, we'll we'll probably dance between those two domains relatively seamlessly because you you can't really have a conversation about robotics without AI. You know, and whether AI has a physical component, you know, that has servos and mechatronics that allow uh, maneuver in 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 space as in uh, three dimensions rather than just in software, I don't think it really matters because what matters is the process of augmentation that's happening. And just, just a sort of anecdote from our industry, um, you know, the scale 
in in data, let's say, um, you know, everyone talks about the, the, the number of, um, you know, web pages or social media posts or, you know, tweets per day, and that's going up. And you, you're never going to have a human being being able to look through that for threats, and it's just not going to happen. Well, the same is happening in, in low Earth orbit. In, in the last 60 years, uh, you know, humans, humans at large, um, all nations have launched about 9,000, I think, satellites, you know, from, from Sputnik onwards, right? In the next 10 years, you know, SpaceX are going to launch 60,000. Amazon are going to launch 40,000, right? So just in the space of, of 10 years, we will launch more objects into orbit than in the entirety of human history combined. Now that's, you know, largely an artifact of cost and, and, and getting the, the cost down, but it, it shows the threat model is exponential. And it doesn't really matter which, whether it's data or, or, or satellites, you'll never have enough humans to do the coverage of the risk landscape. And that's where augmentation comes in. So it's, it, for me, it's never about replacing humans. It's never about, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna make a robot or an AI that replaces a person. What we're going to do is we're going to make human beings a ten thousand times more efficient or ten thousand times more effective at the job, right? And then and they'll be managing, um, you know, much more coverage of risk because at the moment, you know, it, you know, if I was to be blunt, we, we're losing the fight against you know criminals who are you know committing fraud or cyber attacks on on businesses certainly um, in in Europe. Um, you know, and, and the number of frauds outnumbers the number of burglaries uh, in the UK here by something like 10 to 1, you know. So, you know, and how, how many people went to, went to prison for fraud? Very few compared to, compared to burglary. So we have to use AI, we have to use robotics to scale uh, that approach or else we will just keep losing. Yeah, one thing real quick. So the one thing that, that having done a lot with robotics, especially during the time military is, you retrain people, right? And I know this was said in the first panel is, is the person that you would have standing in the lobby as Mark was talking about. Now you, you need somebody to program, maintain, monitor that system. And that moves them up that security echelon like we were talking about. You know, you, you don't have the necessarily the, the 10,000 host standards who are out there. You have people who can now do two or three, four other tasks. And that is a, a multiplier for your company. For your organization and that increases responsibility it increases oversight there's a lot of things that it does help but taking those menial tasks to begin with out of the play is does nothing but help the organization as a whole yeah and and the blurring of those boundaries i think are going to be more and more uh, or exponential i think as we uh, as, as as time goes on absolutely all right then 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 if i stick with you will where where, what do we do with this information? Because it seems that we're going to either be working on the sensors mm -hmm. or we're going to be working on the assimilation, dissemination of all this. You know, it, it seems that we need some sort of military JSTAR program for <laughs> the private sector. I don't know. You know, it, it's, it's like it's like we it, there's something missing, isn't there? Um, well, it, it's a new it's a new task for the GSOC. Um, and that sounds that sounds like it's an overly simplified answer, but I, I've been in some very nice looking GSOCs that can do a whole lot more than than maybe what they're tasked to do. There's people in there who can make decisions that would affect change a lot faster and earlier in the organization. Um, this it's a little decentralized, but that's I think where the the next stop is going to be. That task is going to go up to a level of responsibility, and that's there's going to be everything from maintenance that they're going to need to start tracking status of all the systems that they're pushing around that's not just is this camera up uh, we talked earlier about you know cameras being down when they go to a site facility that's going to go to the gsoc which one of your robots what's the percentage of its capability and when's the last time it had maintenance um, that those types of events are all going to go into the security world because it's a security tool or it should anyway otherwise you end up with stovepipe problems and not necessarily have your hands on you know, your tools at the right time when you need them so, so, so that's a good point because, well, we're already talking about making the SOC analysts lot in life a little bit nicer uh, and maybe eliminate SOC 1, SOC 2. Um, but then again, how do you cut your teeth? It, it's a different question. Um, Mark, how are we going to integrate robotics with, this, with the GSOC? Um, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be 
uh, uh, the robot phoning up an operator and saying, hi, I'm a robot, I've seen this. Is it going to be uh, information feed? How's it done now? I, it's going to be seamless. And, and it is, and it's funny, we're saying going to be, in a lot of cases, it's happening already, right? I mean, and then we'll have to kind of expand our definition of robot, but essentially what's what, what comes in today to some of these uh, security operation centers is an alert. Right, it's some kind of based on AI that David mentioned, based and, and, and will mention. There's some kind of there's an incident that happened at a site that was picked up, right? So that that gets pushed to to a, a security operations center. M most of the time, you know, if somebody you know accidentally trespasses onto a locate, you know, is is loitering and you know because they're waiting for a, a ride from something, you know, they're not doing anything wrong. You know, they'll receive that alert from the device and and they'll move on on their own, right? I mean, um, you know the. The, the 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 child's ball who goes onto a you know kind of controlled area and he goes to get it well that you know creates an alert well it's, it's it's a child picking up picking up a ball as opposed to somebody who's staking out you know a uh, an an area so receive the alert the first interaction is done autonomously by by uh, by the device the second interaction is now that's that human human layer right um, that really pushes that uh, that control, I guess, to the uh, to the next level. And and you know when, when you started the question, Phil, I mean, you talked about you know working on the the uh, the the parts or the technology that's kind of doing the interaction. The other piece is, is the human piece behind it. You know, as we make that transition to a SOC or something, what about the adoption? Right. What about the adoption of not only the SOC operator, but the employee or the person going to a site, maybe the person shopping in the mall? What is their interaction? What is their impression? Right. So that's something that I think we can't take for granted because we're really changing people's mindsets and mindset and people's perception of what they expect of what security is going to look like. I was just going to um, chime in there. I, you know, I think the layered approach is absolutely spot on, but I think there's more likely multiple layers, the AI will be layered on other AI. So one of the things we're doing is we're, we're using uh, cloud computing uh, down here on earth to manage and monitor all of our satellites and all of our, our robots. And so when you combine, you know, cloud technology with all of your other SOC functions, you're, you're able to start layering on other process automation on top of those alerts. So it might be that many of those, as you, as you just said, Philem, one in, level one and two processes, maybe they're AI uh, automated as well. Uh, that would be a different uh, AI and that would be a different process. Um, but a human being might only get involved in the most extreme or difficult to interpret um, alerts. Um, so I, I, definitely, I definitely see, um, you know, cloud computing and, and part of that fusion of multiple streams of information, whether they're from um, sensors, um, cameras in our case, um, uh, all being combined, but but not necessarily by by humans either, um, it, depending on, on what, what the, the the workflow was. But then but then David, how how can we how can, I want to say how can we sell it, right? But maybe a better question is why should we sell it? Um, is, is it even worth trying to sell? Because a lot of the output is what will drive adoption or uptake. Do you think people will care where it's come from? I, I, think, that's, I think the short answer is, is no, as long as it works. Um, you know, the, almost all of the conversations, you know, that I've ever been involved in are about effectiveness and, and efficiency. Uh, and, and if you can find a more efficient way at a lower cost of doing something, then businesses will do it. Um, at the moment, some of these technologies are difficult to implement, have difficulties with um, either the, the AI or the data quality is often uh, tough for, for even for large organizations to manage. So there are cost um, um, sort of implications for adopting this type of technology. Um, although there always is a, a, a very steep drop off in those costs uh, as you get those efficiency savings later down the line. Um, but that will be the maxim that businesses and uh, governments use is, is around, uh, you know, creating more efficiencies, doing more with less, covering more risk, being more effective at their jobs. Um, and, and there will be changes ahead. Yes. And I, 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 I could see 
um, some people will be in 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 different circumstances for sure, but that will be the maximum the, from the top level at least. Yeah, C- can I add really quickly to that? And and it came up in the previous panel, right? Where, where some of the panelists uh, were, were saying, if I had to choose between you know high end training on active shooter or putting a robot in my lobby, you know I would go for training. I mean, uh, so, so would I, right? The security practitioner in me would would do the same thing. But if the question was, I'm going to have some security or no security some security in the traditional way that it's delivered cost, you know, this much. Oh, if I adopt sort of robotic or autonomous type solutions, now the 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 cost is is this much. Okay, well now I can afford some security in that specific instance, right? It's definitely not a blanket. So so to David and and, and to Will's point is, you know, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And then applying that. It's not just kind of saying, hey, you know, it's it's fun, right? You go to you go to different conferences um maybe a little bit less lately but when you go to you know you see all the new things coming out and it's a lot of fun you can you know you can get excited and explore but um you know you really have to bring it back to what's the application within my organization and how am i mitigating risk for 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 my organization absolutely and 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 you talk about the the different conferences and i I wasn't even going to bring this up right but i started life off in the world of defense uh conferences right so a lot of nice topics we did and there was one conference that we kept running every year, even though it, it never grew. It was the same group of experts. It's called Military Robotics. And I said, why are we doing this event? They said, well, because one day it's going to pop and it's really going to be uh, very, very uh, key. And an interesting uh, tidbit, uh, it never popped. It separated. It separated into unmanned ground vehicles and unmanned aerial vehicles and uh, autonomous uh, systems and the stock of the future and, and things like that. And for me, that's maybe a better affirmation than military robotics as a topic popping <laughs> because, because it means it's gone mainstream, right? It's, it's gone mainstream into everything that, that we're doing. Um, will, in that same vein, going mainstream or, or, or you know, uptake, ha, uh, you know, what do you see as the adoption rate over the next five years? We use five years as a sort of arbitrary number, right? But, but, but yes, in the near term, shall we say? Well, I, if it's going on path that we're looking at, I'd say it's going to be pretty high. Um, there's just so much that you can do aut- autonomously. I, I mean, think about it. If you have an emergency action plan, you know, you, incident A happens, whatever it is. And you've got two people that you've tasked to go secure three doors, make sure they're closed, clear this hallway, make sure this is done and make sure this is done. Well, now half of your building is connected through uh, some sort of, uh, whether it's a large company that runs their own um, control capability where they can do all that. So you you bring up to David's point, AI steps in and shuts off all the HVAC to keep the fire from going from point A to point B, say it's a fire. Um, the robot runs down the hallway and makes sure that those rooms are actually empty before anybody has to walk down there and deal with it. Um, that is all going to be very, very enticing to somebody who's got to manage the entire building. I think a lot of the question is going to be, can you bring facilities in play, bring them in with security? You got to, you have to bring all the different stovepipes inside of an organization together and have them collectively say, I think this is a good idea, not only for the security of the building and the security of the people inside of it, but the ability to save the building. If we're going to lose a small portion of it, say, uh, just, I'll go back to the fire incidents. If the faster we get that out, the less property damage we have, the better mm-hmm. off we all are collectively. And if you can cross some of those, some of those lines and get those rice bowl issues moved out of the way, I think it's going to move a lot faster than, than we think it is. I like that. And especially, you know, a lot of corporate security directors at the top of their game, they're thinking, how do I get a promotion? Well, getting a promotion doesn't mean becoming CEO for some reason, right? In, in, a, in a corporation, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean becoming a CEO but it could mean gobbling up health and safety and facilities management. A lot of the companies that we deal with, and we deal with quite a few of them, that is the most successful method that we've seen them adopt new equipment, technology, or processes. It's when you have multiple people buying in and saying, yep, for the collective good, we're going to do this. And you end up with a very successful program out of it. Yeah, and make, making that information accessible and available to all those different stovepipes, and you know whether that's HR operations, facility management, and so on, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that senior leadership in an organization has never said, you know, to, to the security organization, hey, only secure our facilities using these three or four or five methods or mitigating measures or, you know, what, what, whatever it is. They've said, hey, you know what, make sure the organization's assets are protected by whatever means that is. And of course, then you bring your layer on budgets and so on and so forth. But, you know, that's where, that's why I think augment, um, the, uh, the adoption of it and the expansion of it is definitely going to be uh, continuing to grow. And, 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 and then, David, uh, obviously, I, I, I wanted uh, also to bring in that wonderful uh, comedy, Space Force, uh, where there was an adversary which used some robots to, you know, dampen the hopes of other satellite programs, right? Um, and <laughs> th there's that picture of the future. But, but where else could we go uh, with this? What, what, what can we expect to see in the, in the near term? Yeah, I, I think um, I mean, the, the, sad, sadly, and maybe maybe prescient, presciently, the 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 space force uh, program is, is is very accurate. Um, there are there are nefarious uh, arms, robot arms in space, and we don't know what they're for. Um, and uh, you know, anyone, some actors, uh, naming no names, could use them uh, for for very bad things. Um, but I, th I think you know, space is 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 an obvious domain where where security can can. Can be automated with with robotics, and and I, I feel like I've got a very easy kind of job here, where um, you know the, it, it's just just makes sense um, for 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 life on the ground. You know, I definitely see that that mid mid tier the drones obviously has transformed military uh, maneuvers and and ISAR technology in the last uh, two decades, and so that that becoming more available, more more cost effective. You know. Amazon being able to sell you a drone that will fly around your house and, and secure your perimeter, for instance. You know, I, I definitely see that being, you know, a, a core staple of, um, you know, uh, what's out there. I, I suppose just to sort of sum up, you know, I don't think we should fixate too much on the, the sensors themselves because I see the revolution happening in the data. And, and as you correctly said earlier, Philip, you know, if, if the data is not actionable, it's not useful. And, and so I think I see the most of the lion's share of the investment going into what do we do with all of the data from cameras, sensors, images, uh, geospatial, whatever it is, and extracting meaning and value from that um, using using automation. So that could be text, all the video footage, all of the documents that might go through, you know, a, a checkpoint. You know, all of these things are very, very difficult to exploit with, uh, with unless we, you have hundreds of humans, hundreds of, of, of border guards or hundreds of uh, security officers or hundreds of analysts. And the way you scale that is automation. So I, I see the, the majority in the, in the next five years as being, being on that problem. Love it. Well, that is a great point. And, and in fact, John in the audience uh, agrees and says, uh, good point, getting buy-in from stakeholders would be critical, cannot just be a security solution. Um, and, and, and I think this, this panel really captures what we're trying to do uh, with this uh, rather small forum, but rather concise forum. Um, Mark, how do you think we've done in our very short time today? Because I'm, I'm conscious that a lot of this began with conversations that we had, as well as, of course, conversations I had with Robert, uh, you know, with our DMV event. Um, what, what, what do you think we, we might take away from today? Um, just opening our, opening our minds or eyes to the possibility of what else can be done, right? Not, not just keep going up and down the same aisles in the grocery store and, you know, kind of looking for those same, same things. So I think just the idea that people are talking about it and going through different items uh, and, and possibilities and, and being open to explore. So that, that to me is the big, is the big opportunity here is saying, Hey, what else can be done? Um, it's, it's a risk averse industry. Right. Based on our roles, it's completely normal and, and, and that it is that it is that. But let's say, hey, you know, when the technology is proven, whatever the, the scenario, then let's take a look to see if it's a possibility for something that we're that we're doing. Because, you know, if I, I think that if we don't as security professionals, security industry professionals, I think that other industries and sectors will. Right. I mean, uh, the comments about, you know, sort of promotions and so on and so forth. You know, it's not just the security industry that's trying to do that. It's the, it's the other ones, too. And kind of saying, hey, I can bring in some of these aspects if I bring an add value to what's being delivered. 
So that that to me is the important uh, thing of what we're what we're after. Yeah, you 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 know, corporate security professionals uh, listening do not want to suddenly wake up uh, underneath uh, facilities management. Um, uh, well, maybe they do. I don't know. Maybe they already are, so they can't talk about it. But um, I like that. Um, uh, Will, you know, let's say we do this event next year, um, and we expand our agenda. What are some of the pain points that you think we're going to be fleshing out? In, if I found some case studies where a corporation said, I have now been using robots, what are some of the pain points and topics for the panels you think I might want to include? Uh, I'm going to use a TV show since you've done a couple of them now. Like, you got to get past Westworld. Uh, people have to stop thinking as a robot is simply a robot. It's a tool that gives us... Like Mark just reiterated, actionable intelligence that we could do something with. Um, logistics is going to be another one. Um, just like Mark mentioned, that robot going up and down the the, the uh, aisles in the grocery store, and tell me if there's a if there's a, a spill. Yes, that's a great tool, but logistically, it's in everybody's way. It sits there and barks and beeps and says, "Human being, come to aisle 14 to clean up this spill." Uh, logistics is going to be something that you have to figure out. Money is obviously we all acknowledge that it's going to be painful, but I think you actually said the biggest part on money is going to be rental versus buying it. Are you going to be the one that puts in a four hundred thousand dollar purchase? And I don't know what when we're talking about costs, but or do you want to spend twenty three hundred dollars a month? And what does that maintenance contract look like? What's their timely response? And lastly, how can you evolve with it? A in your facility and B. If, you, if you're releasing something or buying something, it's got to be able to have growth as a tool or growth as attachments. If you put a sensor on it right now, in seven, eight, 12 months, that sensor is going to be antiquated and you need to do something to either upgrade it, either with software or some way to keep it working at the top capability that it has. That's kind of the top four I can think of. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Obviously, it's, it's, it's good research for me. You know, it's a good opportunity to find out what we should actually do. But, but I think it, it paints a good picture of where people should start looking, what, what people should start researching. And, 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 and I think that's, that's ultimately very valuable. And nice comments in the audience. Mike says, uh, Will and David, great to see military and intelligence bring more perspective into the conversation. Uh, John says, thanks uh, to all today. Great discussions, ideas and thoughts. And Dennis says, well done, everyone. Uh, very educational. Thank you very much. All right. I think now we have a plan for another session with a bigger, bigger thing. We're going to have to find some case studies willing to talk about it, right? But if we find those case studies, I think we can really uh, do it justice. Um, David, Mark, Will, thanks for being such great panelists. Please give them a big virtual round of applause. Thank you, fellas. It's always great. And I, I, I will see you in the audience for the wrap-up. Thank you.